Poverty is a growing problem in New York City, with one in four residents having incomes below the federal poverty line. Although all minority communities are affected, the Hispanic community bears the biggest burden, with a poverty rate of 42.2 percent. I'm David R. Jones, president of the Community Service Society of New York, a social service agency that every two years tracks and analyzes the city's poverty trends. Today, the urban agenda will be looking at the Hispanic poverty with an expert in the field, Dr. Hector Cordero Guzman, assistant professor at the Milano Graduate School of Management and Urban Policy of the New School for Social Research. Dr. Guzman, uh, no, the nation, nation seems to be doing real great. Everyone keeps telling us that the economy is doing just fine. Uh, how is it uh, affecting the Hispanic community? Well, clearly over the last two or three years, there has been an upswing in the economy. Um, one of the things that this report really doesn't get into is the effects of that recovery on our population. The data mm -hmm. that is used in writing your report is mostly from 1995 and 1996. Right. So what we're seeing in your report is mostly the effects of the, uh, we might call it Giuliani slash Pataki early cuts. Right. Uh, and we still haven't seen, uh, haven't seen the upswing uh, uh, that you're talking about more, more recently in the last 18 to 20 months. Right. Um, one of the things that we do know is that when there is a hit in the economy, that is to say when unemployment in general goes up, unemployment in New York City goes up higher, and for Latinos and African Americans within New York City it goes even higher. Hmm. Um, and another thing that we do know is that when there's a recovery, we're not the first one in line uh, also to get uh, the, the benefits of increased employment. Um, so even though there, ha there has been a, a, an increase in the national economy, one of the things that we do know is that it hasn't affected New York City uh, in all of its sectors right. that well. Uh, one of the things that accompanied this increase in the economy has been, a, if you will, a bifurcation or, or a separation. The recovery has affected those that uh, in a way we're more likely to be affected by a recovery, but it hasn't done much to solve the hardcore poverty problem. Well, well let's talk about the distinctions. Mm -hmm. uh, who, who's doing well? Which, which sectors uh, are actually taking in a lot of Hispanic workers? Um, well, if you look at the sectors that are taking Hispanic workers are mostly the service sectors. Right. And some of the recovery in manufacturing has taken in some Hispanic workers. Uh, but what we do know for the Hispanic population is that unemployment and labor force participation per se are not the biggest part of the problem. Hispanics do get jobs. The right. problem for Hispanics is wages. If you want to contrast that with the problem for African American populations, which is that the biggest hurdle, if you will, is getting the employment right. uh, with wages perhaps a secondary uh, a problem. Mm -hmm. um, so Latinos are being absorbed into the labor market. The question I think that we need to ask ourselves in the, under what conditions, with what kinds of wages, with what kind of benefits, and when we do explore the answer to those things, as your report well shows, uh, the coverage in terms of health and other welfare programs is not really as extensive. What about segmenting it further? How particularly are women in the Hispanic community doing? Are, uh, how do they fit in terms of both recovery, in terms of their labor force participation, and poverty? Well, the, the statistics that you report sites um, show that, for example, the uh, unemployment rate uh, for black women is 11.4 percent. Uh, the unemployment rate for Hispanic men is 13.3%. Uh, um, the unemployment rate for white men is 8%, right. and for white women is 5.3%. Um, so we do know that in terms of unemployment, uh, Hispanics do have a harder time right. uh, looking for jobs. Historically, the labor force participation rate of Hispanic women has been relatively low, i.e. Not, not a lot of them work in the formal sector even though if you compare them uh, uh, to white women, immigrant women do work at a higher rate. Right. What happens is that a lot of the work that these women do is not w work in the formal sector, if you, were, if you will, but it's either in the household sector or in support and in the informal sector, right. working for smaller jobs outside of the, of the house. Um, so again, the problem in that sector is the question of what kinds of benefits are provided, there is no child support that comes with that, right. uh, and also the question of, uh, of the wages that are, that are paid these women for long hours of work. Well, everyone has been talking, obviously, about the new quote, welfare reform. Mm -hmm. uh, what downstream impact do you think uh, might occur in terms of the Latino community and, and welfare reform? Well, welfare reform, the, the major problem with it is that it has not been accompanied by a broad system of supports. Mm -hmm. The idea is that the jobs are out there, and if we only pushed people hard enough, they would occupy those jobs. Mm -hmm. um, 
And the analysis of the labor market does show that there is uh, relatively high unemployment and there's relatively low labor force participation rates in the 50 and 60 percent. So there's abundant numbers of people. Uh, census figures from 1990 show, for example, that in any week there's 300,000 unemployed persons in New York City. Uh, that is people that are actively looking so for, for, for some work and are not finding it. Um, so if these conditions continue and you have, uh, in terms of the welfare system, a limit on the amount of time that people can be on it, uh, what you are beginning to see is A, people are taking jobs that before they wouldn't have taken right. with worse conditions, and B, some of them are, 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 are increasing their participation in what we might want to call the hustle sector or, or, or the informal sector. They're, they're, they're trying to do more things to try to stay right. at the same level economically, and some of them uh, are also losing the, 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 their, their standard of living. The income figures in your report, for example, do show that family incomes in the 1990s are much lower than what they were in the 1980s. In real so real that $29,700 yeah. rate for the right. median family income of four, whereas it was in the 30,000, uh, low 30,000 range in the 1980s. It, it's so always families are having to, to, to live and consume with less. less. And that is not even mentioning the gap that exists between families of various racial and ethnic groups. For example, looking at the income uh, for white families, it's $45,194. Right. If you take that same family and turn it into a black family, it's a 22,150. So the gap between so the nice. average white family and the average black family is almost $23,000. And then take the Hispanic family, which makes $18,400. Um, you see that these gaps are very large, and these gaps are repeated every year. Right. So every year, this one family gets to consume three, four times as much, gets to have three, four times as, as many resources for computers, for their children to go to school, right. for them to invest in their community that these other families don't have. Um, and that is, uh, I think, a big problem. Welfare is meant to supplement that income. Right. And to the extent that we're not doing that, then families economically are going to suffer Let's more. talk about the informal uh, sector. I mean, the conservatives have made a big thing that basically uh, the poverty rates that are issued every year are not accurate, that there's an enormous and vibrant informal uh, economy that allows people to live just fine. Uh, what, it, what makes it up? Uh, I remember it as a boy growing mm -hmm. up in Bedford-Stuyvesant, the informal uh, economy and consisted uh, somewhat of numbers running, mm -hmm. uh, low-level drugs. I mean, uh, what, what are we talking about here in terms of how people are making money on the side? Well, there's, there's two uh, uh, arguments on the, on the poverty line. Right. Um, one of the arguments is the conservative argument, which is that it only takes into account people's formal income. Therefore, when you do a poverty estimate, you're really understating people's real standard of living. Right. The other side of that is that the poverty line was defined by a survey that was done in 1959 by the Social uh, Welfare Administration, uh, Molly Orshansky. And that survey uh, determined what was the minimum amount of food that a family consumed, uh, and then determined that was a third of their income, determined that another third was their rent, and that the other third was other goods. So they took the amount of money that this survey determined they needed for food and multiplied it times three, and that's the poverty line. And that poverty line has just been adjusted for inflation up until today. Okay, so the other side of the poverty line argument is that the, the, the kinds of goods and services that are, that are used to, to construct that basket are very minimal sets of, of goods and services. Um, so um, depending on which, on which side you take, you know, you, you'll, you'll uh, you come to the conclusion that uh, what people do informally to make up for that is either a good thing or a bad thing. And now what kinds of activities do people engage in? Uh, there's, there's various activities. People work in the formal sector for a part of the time, and then from there they might jump to a training program, and then from there they might jump for some part of the year to the informal sector. But there's, uh, there's really not a lot of people that stay in one of the three major economic sectors of, of, of the inner city economy for a sustained period of time. Mm -hmm. um, so people keep, keep shifting yeah, and they take resources from the formal labor market up to the limit that they have because they have to leave for a family crisis or they're fired or whatever. Uh, and from there they move on to another sector. But human beings constantly have to uh, be engaged in any kind of productive activity or depend on the kindness of family and friends or other kinds of networks to be able to survive. And those mm -hmm. activities are activities that thrive in New York. Uh, I don't think that, that the, the existence of those activities in any way should be taken or should be used against the individuals that are mm -hmm. uh, trying to survive. Um, but on the other hand, I mean, the, the more one can do to try to formalize that activity, if you will, um, keep track of it in a way, um, the better it is. But uh, we're always going to discover that human beings are acting much faster than what the bureaucrats and social scientists can catalog. Right. Um, so the informal economy is just more evidence of that, that human beings will do whatever they need to do in a way to survive. Uh, and there's, and there's a, a, the informal economy is not always 
uh, uh, necessarily drug running or, or, or things like that. There are many services that families need that other individuals provide uh, that cannot be provided without any other support from the state right. by matter of subsidies or, or, or any other things. Um, so these are services that are, that, are, that are needed and that are performed and that I don't think we should be blaming uh, individuals that are in very hard conditions right. for trying to do as best they can uh, uh, to try to get, generate some income. And in fact, this speaks against the argument that people in the inner city don't work. Uh, in fact, what we find is the opposite, uh, that, there, that there's o a constant moving uh, between sectors under very difficult conditions. And most of these people, if they found employment that was stable and, and secure, they would be on it. And but a lot of people are on, the, on, that, on those kind of jobs. Let's talk about something else. In, in Washington, D.C., uh, the incarceration rate for black young men has been somewhere estimated to be about 50 percent right. of youngsters between the ages of, I think, 16 and 23. Right. What is, what is the, uh, the history and, and uh, position of Latino young men in terms of incarceration rates and labor force participation? How are they doing in this economy? Well, um, the, the incarceration, I mean, the, you have to sort of separate there the, the Latino population. It seems that one of the things we find is that Latinos that have been here for one or two generations um, who have not grown necessarily with, with the image of prevailing wages that dominates in the countries where they come from, but have grown with the kind of expectation for consumption and material goods right. that are uh, inherent in this society. Yeah. And at the same time are confronted with, their with the reality that the educational system has failed them, therefore they don't have the skills to compete in the labor market. A lot of those individuals uh, are going through the same difficult conditions that we might say the African American population has gone through, right. and the Puerto Rican population has gone through. Uh, so, th so there is a problem, even though we don't have, uh, I don't think statistics are kept necessarily in the same kind of uh, way that the African-American right. white statistics are kept. Yeah. And as you know, even in the Korean population survey, sometimes it says Hispanics can be of any race, race because people right. are classified. Moving all around. Right. Uh, but we do know that there, is, there, are, there are unreasonably high incarceration rates. Uh, and, and they're explained in part by a contraction of the formal labor market right. and by the fact that the labor market is absorbing uh, uh, newer influxes of immigrants and, mm -hmm. if you will, uh, uh, discarding uh, uh, those generations. In New York State, for example, you have, uh, last year, you had more individuals uh, in the incarceration system than what you had in the higher education system. Mm -hmm. uh, it was about 40,000 more, and it was around the 500,000 range. Okay, so there were 40,000 more uh, uh, youngsters in, in, the, in the jails at a cost of 35 to $40,000 per year uh, as compared to the higher education system, which costs vary from anywhere from 5000 to 15000 You raised an interesting issue, though. Uh, you know, again, stereotyping mm -hmm. Hispanics all as one amorphous mass. Mm -hmm. Actually, there's an enormous segmentation within right. the uh, Hispanic community. Can you tell our audience a little bit about that? Because it has such an impact on what Well, there, there, there is a lot of variation in the, in the Hispanic population. On the one hand, you have the, the largest group, which is the Puerto Rican group, which is the oldest immigration right. from the 1920s, 30s, and 40s. Hispanics are not technically immigrants because they're U.S. citizens, so they can move freely sure. back and forth. Uh, and, and they are the, the sort of largest segment. The second largest segment is the Dominican uh, population, which has been immigrating in large numbers pretty much since 1965. And what you see in the Dominican population, in a way, is a, is, is, a, is a repetition of some of the patterns that you did see for the Puerto Rican population. The early cohorts have a very good entry into the labor market, mm -hmm. but as subsequent generations move in, they find, and they depend more on the educational system, the educational system fails them, so it's more difficult for them to achieve the skills that they need to move into the better, better jobs. Right. Uh, then you have the Colombian yeah, and Ecuadorian right. population, which are the two sort of largest from South America. And you also have a significant contingent of, uh, of Peruvians. You have growing groups of, of Mexicans, Salvadorians, Honduras and Guatemalans, and a lot of those individuals left originally in the 1980s as a result of civil wars in their countries of origin. So those mm -hmm. individuals were not selected necessarily because of their skills or because they knew of a job. They left very difficult conditions and their networks took them in a way okay. to, to New York City. And some of those communities have thrived uh, in the city. Um, so the Latino community is composed of second generation individuals that are the descendants of the early cohorts of Dominicans, Puerto Ricans, and some Central Latin Americans. Right. And you have also newer groups of immigrants coming in uh, almost every year, most of them coming in from Dominican Republic, again, Colombia, Mexico, uh, Ecuador, uh, Peru, uh, El Salvador. Uh, One of the worrisome things uh, on another program that I did some months ago was uh, uh, people took our poverty report and began to wave it around as a justification for sharper re restrictions mm -hmm. in immigration. 
Do you see any real danger of, of a new nativist flair here, uh, using welfare reform and time limits as a justification, particularly of cutting off Latinos and other immigrants of color? And I don't, I don't sure, know. Sure, that's, I mean, that, that, that's always a difficult issue, which is when you have a finding that your poverty rates are increased because there's a lot of immigration into your area. Right. And that those immigrants tend to have below average education, uh, and some of them tend to have uh, relatively low incomes, which then inflates your poverty statistics. Right. The immediate reaction is to say, well, let's kick those people out. Right. Um, when you look at an immigration, you have to look at a, a sort of a, a number of broad components. N number one, what is the history of that country with the United States of America? Hmm. Number two, what are the characteristics of the individuals that are, that are coming from that country? And, 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 and some countries uh, send pretty much labor migrants. Other countries send the distribution of, of people in the sort of socioeconomic structure. Right. Number three, how, is, how are those immigrants received in the country when they get here, either legally or socially or economically? And number four, what kinds of opportunities are there for that community to advance? So you cannot look at the outcome of any one group without looking at the parts of the process that lead you there. Yeah. Um, so going back to the reaction, people say, well, if there's immigrants that are, that are low-skilled and increase the poverty rate, the solution to that is just to say, well, you can't come here. Number one, it's very difficult to say you can come here because people come people for a variety come. of reasons in a variety of means right. that are very difficult to stop very easily. Uh, and number two, uh, my solution to the problem is to say, what are the conditions that lead to poverty and how could we solve those conditions? In the home to, country. In the home country and here. Yeah. As opposed to trying to blame the individuals for the conditions that they're in, right. the better approach would be to look at those conditions, see what causes those conditions, and try to do something to solve those conditions. We know that we can do a lot by investing more aggressively in our educational system. Well, that's, that's uh, a good segue into the, what are we going to do about an educational system that uh, it, it's apparent is failing Latinos you know, and African Americans at incredible rates. I mean, we, 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 we talk a lot about the eight billion dollar budget that serves one million students and uh, as if that has to be prima facie evidence that it's enough. Right. Um, nothing says that that is necessarily enough. And I think one of the problems with the school system is our problem of resources. Very simple resources like computers, like books, uh, uh, material things that are the things that help students do better. Right. They are, that are the things that students have in richer districts and that they take for granted in richer districts. That in our districts are uh, luxuries. So those luxuries should become standard and our children will thrive better. The second thing that needs to happen is something at the level of organizational structure. The school system seems to me to be very much bureaucratically entrenched and not open enough to hear from those immigrant communities about what works in those communities. Mm -hmm. and how in a way to make sure that we have a, a program that establishes what the best practices are and that those practices are then spread throughout the system. Um, so to me it's a matter of resources and a matter of structure uh, and, and in a way also a matter of curriculum but we've been through those battles before. Well, well clearly there's also the question of resource allocation that, you, that you've touched upon. Uh, we did some studies uh, oh four or five years ago yes. now uh, looking at the experience level of the teachers who were con who ended up concentrated in, in poor and uh, both black and Latino neighborhoods. And clearly they had sh uh, higher concentrations of per diem and substitute teachers. Right. And their experience levels were sharply different from that of more advantaged neighborhoods. Because more advantaged, more, more, more senior teachers want to take themselves away from those environments. But I think in the overall educational equation, the proportion of the problem that is due to teachers is not really that big. Uh, I think a lot of the teachers that I do see in a lot of yes. these schools are individuals that are extremely motivated and that are doing their best to try to make sure that these children survive very difficult conditions. I think the conditions are not solved internally. The conditions have to be solved by a combination of internal factors and external factors. And I think it's those external factors that are not there. Uh, the, the, the years that your report covers, again, are the years where we saw the biggest cuts to the city university system and to the public school system, mm -hmm. and to behave and pretend that those cuts don't have concrete effects, and that there are children that could have done much better that are not doing better because of those cuts, uh, is to kid ourselves, uh, and to pretend that four years later you can then infuse another 800 million and say, I've solved the problem. Uh, it's, it's also very ridiculous. It's not simply a problem of money, again. It's a problem of resources and structure. Uh, it's how you organize that money to be distributed for tangible things that students can learn from and can use. And I think that that's a big problem. And when, when you do solve that problem, you'll see that not only immigrant children would benefit, but African-American children would benefit, Latino, other Latino children would benefit, and even white children would benefit. What are the other barriers you see towards uh, employment uh, participation uh, among the Hispanic population? Well, in, when we talk about um, uh, barriers to employment, I think we need to break them into three broad kinds of barriers. Okay. 
The first set of barriers are barriers that do not allow Latinos to get the credentials and the skills that they need to be able to compete for the kinds of jobs that are opening up. Right. Uh, and those are barriers that have to do, again, with education, with employment training programs, and with placement of employment training programs. Number two, or the second kind of barrier that we see that also affects the African-American population is, once you do have those skills, how are those skills evaluated by the person that's interviewing you for the job, uh, by the person that is examining that opening? And, and when we do our research, we do find that if we, when we take two individuals with the same resume that just vary by their race and ethnicity, the individuals are not treated the same. So one of the obstacles is getting the skills. The second obstacle is getting our skills evaluated in the same way. Right. And then the third obst obstacle that we see is, okay, we got the skills. We were able to persuade the person that we're not like everybody else from our group, so therefore right. we deserve the job. It's two big obstacles. And then we find that sometimes when we do get the job, we're compensated at a different rate than other people that are performing this same job are compensated. Or that our, our, our job description all of a sudden changes and mm -hmm. is and it's minimized. So I think in order to solve the employment problem for Hispanics, we need to attack those three barriers simultaneously, i.e. increase the amount of skills and the, pro and the programs whereby skills are given to the population. Number two, set programs whereby skills are evaluated openly and fairly, and, and, and that in a way reduces the cost of discrimination. And number three, set up monitoring systems such that once individuals are employed, we can, we can in a way track them in, in their employment and that they're doing like their other colleagues. And we hear many stories of individuals that uh, are professionals that find themselves saying, we, I, I went to the right schools, I did a lot, I did, and I, why am I advancing at a slower rate than my colleagues? Why does it seem to me that I have a heavier weight to carry? And those are obstacles at the three steps of the process that I think until we solve the three, until we deal with the three simultaneously, we're always going to be hitting ourselves against the and, wall. And where do you think the best pressure on this? I mean, clearly we seem to be running the other way. I mean, in terms of the ideolo uh, ideology of New York and the nation, uh, these kinds of steps are certainly not even in everyone's uh, uh, foremost uh, ideas of what are going to happen. But, but what hap what's happening is that what we're seeing is an, an increase in the racial, ethnic, and economic bifurcation of the city. Right. And one of the things that we know from history is that great cities cannot continue to be and cannot survive unless there is a, a large segment of, of the middle class, in a way. Uh, that, that is what keeps the, cons the consumption sector growing, the employment sector growing, and it's what sustains the tax base of the city, what provides services for those that are worse off. Um, so in a way, I mean, uh, the, the, the increased pressure that inequality itself is going to bear on bear on the city is going to demand a solution. Uh, if individuals are, are, are want to continue to see the, the city thrive, they will be forced, in a way, to have through fiscal programs, uh, uh, particularly tax programs and right. others, uh, redistribute more of the gains of the last few years onto more people. What about political participation, which which is lacked actually in the late political period. participation is something that our community needs to be blamed for, uh, i.e. Uh, yes, there are many barriers to entry into the political system. Right. Yes, there are many elites and many cliques that do set policy that we're not a part of. But on the other hand, uh, we are also forced to tell our community constantly that participation is not uh, a dead end street, that, that, that through increased political participation, pressure can be brought to bear so that some of those policies that are detrimental to our community do not find the support that they currently find. Um, so, so while I would not blame our community for its own problems and say if we simply participated that would solve everything, I think participation will go a long way towards bringing more pressure to bear. Uh, along the kinds of pressures I was mentioning before are going to be need to be brought to bear if we're going to solve the broader racial, ethnic, and economic inequality problem in this city. What about intergroup uh, and intragroup uh, coalition? Uh, clearly, uh, there was a period of time for the African American community where they were not visible, but there were deep s splits between Caribbean Americans and African American indigenous populations, and it led to some real political problem coming together. Um, there is some sense that you're having some of the same problems in the uh, Latino community. Uh, are, is there an effort to, to heal those uh, uh, rifts and come together well, with mean, Ecuadorians uh, and Peruvians and, and Puerto Ricans and the, and the rest? I cl clearly. I mean, uh, the Latino community is heterogeneous, and there are many national origin groups that mm -hmm. have two kinds of issues in mind. One, issues that affect my country, right. and that are specific to U.S. foreign policy towards my country. Yes. And a lot of time, those groups spend a lot of time dealing with those issues, but a lot of those groups that have been a long time here also recognize that in fighting for better schools, and in fighting for less discrimination in the labor market, they have an issue in common not only with other South American or Central American or immigrant groups, but with also other national origin groups. Mm -hmm. So I th think that we're seeing a, a political maturity of, of the Latin American and the Central American political community. And we are seeing uh, coalition building. What happens is that uh, often we all suffer from, 
from this uh, Faustian bargain, which is that the higher our leaders sort of make it, the more they tend to forget where they came from. <laughs> and that's a problem in the Puerto Rican community, group. in the Dominican <laughs> community, and in the... Uh, but, we, uh, but on the other hand, we are seeing the formation of strong coalitions that are, that are Latino coalitions, that are African-American and Latino coalitions, that are trying to you know, break through the clouds. And, and, and bring some light in, into the discussion. And I think that that's where our efforts should be focused on right. because those issues ultimately affect us all. I mean, when we talk about bringing computers to the school, the computer doesn't discriminate who's using it and right. doesn't care who's using it. And at some level, we shouldn't either. Uh, what we should make sure is that the resources are there. Uh, and, and, and when resources are scarce, what we do see is that competition increases. Uh, and sometimes we end up shooting ourselves in the foot to fight for the crumbs. There, there's one thing that uh, I know some economists have said that the uh, sort of business cycle has been revoked in the uh, United States mm -hmm. since Mr. Greenspan mm -hmm. took over. Uh, but if they're wrong and we do start to see economic instability, recessions, uh, this has been a recovery that's gone over seven years. Uh, it's un not unprecedented, but it's mm -hmm. getting near the, uh, mm -hmm. the outer limits of that. What is going to be the, d the immediate impact on the Hispanic community when we hit the first serious recession? What about the job gains that have been made? Uh, how sensitive to it? Very sensitive. When, I, when you look at the poverty rate uh, for the country uh, and, and compare that to the Hispanic poverty rate, you see that when the poverty rate for the country goes down, uh, the poverty rate for Latinos goes down by a lot more. In a way, you know, when the country sneezes, the <laughs> Latinos catch pneumonia. Right. Uh, the, 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 the hits are much worse. Right. And, and, and when, when we know that, because last hired, first fired, you know, we're always the, the last ones to enter into the major significant sectors and we'll be the first ones to let go once a recession hits. Uh, what we're trying to do is to avoid the negative. And, and, and one of the problems with the recession hitting and one of the problems with having welfare reform coincide with an economic expansion is that when you're evaluating the effects of welfare reform, right. you can't separate. And you can't say, well, this is the effect of pure welfare reform versus this is the effect of economic growth. And I think that people are kidding themselves in attributing a lot of the, the absences or, or people leaving the welfare roles and saying this is a result of our reforms. A lot of that is due to the effect of a growing economy. And once that economy stops growing, you'll be a very good question to see what's going to happen to most of the families. And I'll be curious to whether the, the Human Resources Administration and other departments that fund welfare are in fact setting up efforts on the way and research efforts to actually find out what happens to those cases. Or is there approach going to be once the tournament is over, you're, you're not no longer our responsibility. Because we are going to pay for it one way or another. Again, mm -hmm. if it costs thirty-five to forty thousand dollars to put someone in jail and it costs only ten, fifteen thousand dollars to educate them, you don't have to be a genius to figure out which is a better investment. Thank you very much, Professor. Thanks to you. The latest studies show that the Hispanic population is losing ground in education, income, and labor participation. No question there is a cause and effect in operation here. With New York's Latino communities continuing to grow, the city can't afford to ignore the problem of deepening Hispanic poverty. If the alarm bells have not yet rung for our political leaders, they have been asleep too long. This is David R. Jones. Thanks for watching The Urban Agenda. To comment on the Urban Agenda or for more information on CSS, contact Community Service Society of New York, 105 East 22nd Street, New York, New York, 10010, area code 212-254-8900.